All right, C4 and cam plants. That's the title. You guys like titles. So it turns out that our friend Rubisco, we, we saw Rubisco before. It's an enzyme. It actually has a very long name, which I, I wrote down here. It's called uh, ribulose, and it's 1,5, bisphosphate. You'll remember that uh, compound. And then it, it's ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. So the azes are telling us that this is an enzyme, and it's describing what it does. It takes this ribulose 1,5 bis. Whoops, I didn't spell that right. Crap. Bisphosphate. Let's fix that. It's taking this molecule. And it's the carboxylase means it's joining to it a carbon dioxide or fixing a carbon dioxide to it. Or the oxygenase means that it can also fix an oxygen molecule to it. So Rubisco is sort of a two-way molecule. And that's what we want to understand here. It reacts to both carbon dioxide and oxygen. And so how does it know which one to do? Um, first of all, if Rubisco acts on carboxylase, then we get um, uh, the, the entire process of photosynthesis that we talked about in the Calvin cycle. And we, well, let's, let's put down the Calvin cycle. We know how that works. And of course, what do we get from that? We get the, the formation of glucose as a stored energy molecule made up of all those carbon dioxides that it was grabbing and fixing. But if it grabs oxygen instead, it produces a molecule, an intermediate molecule, that is pretty much useless. Let's call it the useless molecule. And this molecule has to then go through a, a complicated process And that complicated process turns it, essentially, it involves mitochondria, it involves peroxisomes, it involves a whole bunch of, of things that have to happen. But eventually, it turns this into carbon dioxide, but no glucose. In other words, it's a complete waste of energy and effort. It requires ATP. The cell has to use its energy to deal with this mess if Rubisco combines with oxygen, right? It costs energy. It costs ATP. So the cells obviously don't want to do this. This process here uh, is called something. It's called photorespiration. But it's a useless process. It's no good to the cell. It wastes, it wastes uh, the... Um, the rubisco, basically, it makes the rubisco do something it's, it's just not useful. And this is a great example, actually, of, of, uh, to remind us of the fact that, that nature, as much as it looks like it's a very organized, complex set of processes, these processes have evolved essentially through random assortment by the environment based on slight evolutionary advantages to survival. And so... When uh, ribulose, or sorry, when uh, rubisco is, uh, evolves as an enzyme, it's not evolving with the purpose of making CO2. It's evolving as an enzyme that can do two things, one of which is quite beneficial to the plant, and the other which is essentially useless. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Useless. Useless molecule is the word there. Right. Okay. So, um, essentially, we have to figure out how do plants do the green instead of the red? Because obviously one is good for them and one isn't. If, if they didn't, then there would be an evolutionary change for these poor plants. And uh, there has to be a way for this part to be uh, more accessible to the plant. 
accessible. Okay, so it turns out that under normal conditions, um, Rubisco, let me go back to my black, under normal conditions, Rubisco has a slightly larger affinity for carbon dioxide. Slightly greater, let's call it, greater affinity for CO2. So that helps, because given the choice, it'll probably take the CO2 more often than not. Um, but that's under standard conditions. The conditions in the plant are by no means constant and standard, because as the plant is using up some things and it's trying to access other things, the levels of things are in a constant state of flux. Okay. So, but, uh, let's put it this way, but when CO2 levels drop, which they would in a plant that was running its Calvin cycle, right? Fixing the carbon dioxide into glucose. When CO2 levels drop, uh, Rubisco will readily choose oxygen. Readily bind with oxygen. For a plant, uh, we could say that under, under normal living conditions, normal plant living conditions, Rubisco binds with CO2 about 75% of the time. 75% of the time, which is pretty good. Three quarters of the time, the plant is getting this, this rubisco. So that's not too bad. It's under regular conditions. Now you will recall, one of those key conditions is the amount of carbon dioxide available to the plant. And you'll recall from the other video, when we talked about the leaf and the stomata and how they regulate the CO2 in the plant. And so we have to kind of go back to... Um, you know, uh, uh, that picture, I'm just going to draw a very rudimentary leaf here. And, you know, the vascular bundle that's inside and the mesophyll cells, right, that, that are where the photosynthesis is taking place. And we saw that carbon dioxide can enter into the cell through the open stomata, but when that happens, water is lost. So there's this trade-off that has to happen. So plants that live in reasonably arid or reasonably, I guess, uh, moist conditions have learned to sort of open and close the stomates based on water loss, but there seems to be uh, enough, enough time open when they can get the carbon dioxide they need and keep the, the rubisco binding with it to keep the storage of glucose happening. The real problem is plants that are in dry climates, desert plants and things like that they have a problem where they can't keep their stomates open as often. They have to shut them down. Well, they shut down automatically as the plant dries out. And so they have a little bit of a problem. And so, first of all, we're going to look at what are called the C4 plants. And the C4 refers to a four-carbon molecule. A four-carbon molecule that... Uh, you'll recall that typically what, what some most plants do is they, they produce a three carbon molecule that in the in the carbon or the Calvin cycle. Um, these plants have a slightly different pathway that occurs just before the Calvin cycle, where they convert um, into a four carbon molecule. They convert carbon dioxide into a four carbon molecule. That's why they're called C4 plants. So we're just going to look at that process. And uh, essentially, if you recall, there was the, the vascular bundle, right, that we had talked about. There was the, say, say, a vascular tubule. And then we used this brownie color to draw the bundle sheath cells that would surround the vascular tissue and then the mesophyll cells. So I'm just drawing representative of each cell here. Right? But this, this used to look like we had the, 
the xylem and the phloem like this, and the bundle sheath cells were, were all around the, like this, and then the mesophyll cells on the outside, right? So we're just drawing one representation of this. So you might want to label it uh, mesophyll cell, right? And then in your brown color, bundle sheath cell. And then the, vas the, the tubule here, this would be the vascular tubule, whether it's a phloem or a xylem uh, tubule. And so essentially what we're going to see is that um, if you look at the picture of your leaf, the mesophyll cells are the ones that are directly in contact with the spaces. So the CO2 can directly be accessed by the mesophyll cells. Right, but that's also mean, that also means that if there's O2 building up, that O2 is in those spaces in the mesophyll, and if the conditions are not favorable, and the stomates are closed, most of the CO2 will be gone. The O2 will be building up, and it will start to bind with Rubisco and kind of mess up the whole process of the Kelvin cycle. And so what has to happen is there has to be a way to make sure that most of our Rubisco is actually combining with carbon dioxide instead of this building up oxygen. Lauren. I'm going to make a bigger picture here, and we're going to draw the reactions, if we can, happening right inside the appropriate cells. So here's my mesophyll cell, and here's my bundle sheath cell, like this. And then I can put the tubule on the end, which isn't really critical to this process. So it's the same picture. I'm just making it bigger so we can, we can look at the process in detail. Okay. So instead of Rubisco, the mesophyll cells contain um, phosphoenolpyruvate, PEP. So let me put in green here. Uh, let me know. Let me use a different color. I'll use black. Uh, phosphoenolpyruvate, or PEP. I'll just call it PEP for here, but you can write it down if you want. Phosphoenolpyruvate. Sure. Phosphoenolpyruvate, right? PEP. That's different than Rubisco. So what happens is the carbon dioxide that's out here in the spaces, the air spaces in the mesophyll, diffuses through the membrane, and it combines through an enzyme with this PEP. The PEP converts it into a molecule of oxaloacetate. And then the molecule of oxaloacetate is converted into a molecule called malate. Malate. So what this is essentially doing is it's changing the carbon dioxide into a different form. It's changing the carbon. Rather than the carbon going directly to Rubisco and through the Kelvin cycle and then into glucose, instead, this little step happens where the carbon dioxide is turned into oxaloacetate by this PEP, right? well, by, by an enzyme that combines it with PEP, phosphoenolpyruvate. Then the malate is shuttled. So I'm going to use a different color here. The malate is shuttled across I'm using an arrow here to show that this is being carried across the cell membrane. And when it's carried across the cell membrane into the bundle sheath cell, it essentially then can turn into uh, a molecule of pyruvate. So let's go up here like this, and let's write, write pyruvate. 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 The pyruvate then can be shuttled back across the membrane, back into the um, into the mesophyll cell. But of course, the process, and then it will of course turn back into this phosphoenolpyruvate. But this process requires energy, and so to make this happen, an ATP has to be used up in this process. 
And the ATP has to be used to, um, actually it turns it into AMP, not ADP. That's an interesting, we haven't seen AMP. Um, that's when two phosphates get removed. So let me just change that. AMP, adenosine monophosphate. It's sort of like a double removal. So it costs quite a bit of energy to make this happen. Um, and there's obviously some phosphates and things that are involved, but we're not going to worry too much about that. We're worried about what's in black here and, and the fact that it does cost energy to do this. So why would the cell want to do this? Well, because a product of converting malate into pyruvate is carbon dioxide. So the CO2 that's released now is in, is in the bundle sheaf cell. So this little chemical change of fixing the carbon dioxide with PEP and turning it into malate allows this cell to move the carbon dioxide from the mesophyll into the bundle sheaf cell. The bundle sheaf cell, if you recall, is protected. It's protected by or from the building up carbon dioxide and, and our sorry, oxygen levels out here. The oxygen is sort of touching the mesophyll cells. So the mesophyll cells are, in a sense, moving the carbon dioxide into the bundle sheaf cells so that the rubisco there will get carbon dioxide and won't be... Uh, tempted to join up with the oxygen, which is raising in high concentrations. So it's changing the location of the carbon dioxide through a clever little chemical transport. And it's protecting the rubisco, keeping it shielded as much as possible from the increasing oxygen levels. It's true the oxygen will slowly diffuse through, but it slows it down, right? It creates a barrier. And so essentially then this carbon dioxide that's now in the bundle sheath cell can go through the Calvin cycle, as usual, the normal Calvin cycle. And it can make the glucose and do what it needs to do. And that glucose that it makes will then be transported into this vascular bundle, this vascular tissue, like phloem, for instance, and transported through the cell, right? So instead of just having the Calvin cycle happening in the mesophyll, to prevent the rubisco from being exposed to too much oxygen, because remember why it's exposed to too much oxygen, right? So let me just summarize the whole process. This is a desert plant. It's in the dry conditions. So it has to close its stomates because the water is being evaporated. So the stomates will close automatically in a dry situation, which would kill the plant. without It would suffocate the plant. But because the plant has this extra little shuttle system and it moves the malate into the bundle sheath cell, it's moving the carbon dioxide away from the building up of oxygen, which will then attack and uh, bind to all the rubisco. So the rubisco in the bundle sheath cell isn't going to get much oxygen content and it's going to get CO2 that it needs. Question. That's a good question. How long can the plant do this for? These plants, C4 plants, do this all the time, and that's why they're special. So this is an alternative sort of biochemical pathway that these plants have evolved over the years in order to live and survive in dry conditions. So dry desert plants will do this all the time. Yeah. Okay, so if you, if you look back at this picture, where is the oxygen? So there's the bundle sheath cell, there's the mesophyll cell. So the oxygen is in the space, right? It's in the space out here around the mesophyll cells. And if the stomates are closed to save water loss, no carbon dioxide comes in and O2 is building up because the plant is photosynthesizing. It's trying to survive, right? So as the O2 builds up, if, if not for this new mechanism, that O2 would bind with all the rubisco and shut the Calvin cycles down which is bad news for the plant. So instead, the plant doesn't, doesn't run its Calvin cycle in the mesophyll. It pumps the carbon dioxide into the bundle sheath cell by converting it into these little molecules. 
pumps them across, and then those molecules can then be reconverted back into CO2. So you see the CO2 here is available for Rubisco, and there's, it minimizes the oxygen. And that's essentially what C4 plants do. Right? They use phosphoenyl pyruvate, a four-carbon molecule, to catch the carbon dioxide first, not uh, the Rubisco. The Rubisco would be doing its action in the bundle sheaf cell, safe from most of the oxygen. Fair enough? Okay. And that's really it for the, for the C4 plants. The next are the CAM plants. They're a little bit different. So CAM plants. And uh, the word CAM comes from the, the family name of the kind of plants that do this. The family, the name of the family of plants that do this is the Crassu. C E A N. The Crassulation, Crassulation acid metabolism. That's what this is called. And it's named after, um, so CAM, Crassulation acid metabolism. Uh, Crassulaceae. is a family. It's a, it's a classification. It's the family of plants that do this particular thing. And these are also plants that live in very dry environments, some cactuses and things, but they've come up with a slightly different approach. They don't use the C4. They simply do everything according to usual, but watch what they have learned to do. Essentially, they regulate their stoma, stomata opening and closing. So let me use one color here. Well, I'll put two, two uh, titles. But what they do is they do something in the day and something at night. They separate the fixation of carbon by time instead of by location. Instead of moving the carbon to a safer spot. They just change the time during which they're going to do this. So uh, during the day, um, you have the Kelvin cycle doing its thing. And if the Kelvin cycle is, is doing its thing, uh, it's going to be building up oxygen, right? Now, of course, during the day, the stomata are closed because it's so hot and dry. So what the plant does is it allows itself to sort of suffocate a little bit. And it allows itself to build up a bunch of oxygen that is going to start to interfere with the rubisco and, and interfere with the Calvin cycle. Okay? But at night, it opens the stomata. At night, it tends to be a little cooler and perhaps a little moister and so the plant can open the stomata at night and sort of breathe so at night um, what it does is it goes through the C4 process it shuttles the uh, because there's a bunch of oxygen in there. So it shuttles the, the carbon dioxide as malate into bundle sheaf cells. But it does this only at night. So the, C the C4 process, which includes the Calvin cycle, right, happens at night. So you basically, have, um, you basically have plants that sort of decide to do two different things depending on the time of day. Depending on the time of day. And the, sto the stomata are open at night, so what can happen is the gas exchange can happen. And you can get rid of all that built-up oxygen over the day, and you can replenish the carbon dioxide that you need for the next night or the next day. So during the day, stomata close, the Kelvin cycle runs, but it builds up oxygen, O2 buildup. Let's put O2 build up on this side. And carbon dioxide becomes low. So then nighttime comes, and the stomata can gradually open. But it does take time for the gas exchange to happen. 
So as the stomata are opening and re replenishing the carbon dioxide in the mesophyll spaces, the plant then begins the C4 process of shuttling the carbon dioxide and, uh, and running uh, the, turning it into malate, moving it across into the bundle sheaf cells and using it. So again, this protects it from the built-up oxygen. So while the oxygen is being evacuated by the somata and new CO2 is coming in, this is happening in the meantime to keep the plant going, to keep it alive. Okay. All right. So one way to do this process, um, one way to do it is to change the location of the CO2. And that's the, what C4 plants essentially do. But you can also change the time. Change the time of carbon dioxide fixation, which is turning it into glucose. And so that's what the CAM plants have in addition. They still use the C4 process, but they have this additional, um, additional mechanism of just doing it when, uh, whether it's day or night, right? They can do it in the daytime, but then they can do this nighttime thing where they can close the stomates. Um, so it's slightly more advantageous. So you see this in certain cactuses and things that live in extremely dry climates. So that's the basic idea. If you were to summarize, this picture up here is pretty much it. What happens is carbon dioxide is fixed into oxaloacetate by combining it with PEP, phosphoenyl pyruvate. And then it's turned into malate, and the malate is shuttled into the bundle sheath cells. That's the key point, because that moves the carbon away from the oxygen. And then it's turned back into carbon dioxide, and now because it's moved away from the oxygen, so in this picture, the oxygen, whoops, lost it. In this picture, the oxygen is way over here, right? It's out here in the spaces around the mesophyll cell, but the bundle sheath cell is sort of shielded from it. So the carbon dioxide that's released inside is free to enter the Calvin cycle and do its thing. And the rubisco is not going to be all saturated with oxygen. And then, of course, what happens is the malate, after it releases the CO2, turns into pyruvate, which is then transported and turned back into the phosphorenal pyruvate. But that requires ATP, right? Because you'll remember that... In respiration, it goes the other way. Phosphoenyl pyruvate turned into pyruvate, right, as the final step, and gave us some ATV, ATP. This requires an input. So this costs the plant a little bit of energy, but it's worth it if you're going to live in a desert, essentially. Okay, so that kind of wraps up the last little bit of photosynthesis. So we'll stop this.